All right, so radioactivity, nuclear chemistry. Uh, we're gonna go through this fast. I think radioactivity, nuclear chemistry is all super interesting, super weird. It's one of the things about chemistry that really bothers me because when anything undergoes radioactive decay, as we'll talk about, uh, we have no handle for controlling that. There's no way to speed it up, there's no way to slow it down, it happens at the rate it happens. Uh, all right. So you've probably had some encounter with higher energy radioactivity. Um, for example, nuclear medicine uses a number of different methods. Uh, this one looks like it's an x-ray, it might be a CT. Um, but you can use it to get images, clear images of internal organs without actually cutting somebody open. So this test for uh, appendicitis, radioactively tagged isotopes are given to the patient that have an affinity for the appendix um, if there's an infection. So those antibodies will get picked up or will pick up the radioactive isotopes and carry them all to the appendix and then you can see if somebody's got appendicitis. Radioactivity is the emission of tiny energetic particles by the nuclei of certain unstable atoms. These atoms are said to be radioactive. Many of these particles can pass through matter. Uh, and that's part of what makes them so dangerous in high, high concentrations. So uh, radioactivity was discovered in or 1896 by Antoine Henri Becquerel. Probably butchered that. He hypothesized that the greenish glow of phosphorescence, which is a type of glow, was associated with the emission of x-rays, which are an invisible type of radiation. We talked about that in like chapter 11. Uh, so he exposed potassium uranyl sulfate, so it has uranium in it, uh, to sunlight and then placed them on a covered photographic plate. The plate showed a dark exposure spot where the crystals had been because of the admission, emission of x-rays. <coughs> Baccarel believed that his hypothesis was correct, so he must have tried it a number of times, and then he presented his results that phosphorescence and x-rays were linked. But he had to later retract his results when he found that a dark exposure spot had formed even the crystals had not been exposed to light. So his hypothesis was, Leave this stuff out in sunlight, it absorbs energy from the sun, and then you can put it on this photographic paper and it will emit x-rays because it's been excited by the light from the sun. Uh, his mistake was that it didn't need to be exposed to light. It was always just emitting these x-rays. So he called those uranic rays because there was uranium in the crystals he was using. Marie Curie, uh, was one of the first women in France to pursue doctoral work, which is kind of wild. She discovered two new elements in her search for other substances that emitted these, as they called them, uranic rays. Polonium, which is named for her home country of Poland, and radium, for its high level of radioactivity, it will actually glow and emit heat. And I think there was a documentary or something recently about the radium girls, who were these Girls who worked in a factory painting watch faces with radium. And uh, it's one of the, actually, that's one of the first times they discovered that, oh, these, radi these uh, uranic rays, this radioactivity is actually really dangerous because at the time they didn't think it was dangerous. So these girls would have these paintbrushes and they would stick them in their mouths and use their saliva to make it a really fine tip so that they could paint onto these tiny watch faces. Uh, they would also just paint their teeth with the paint, paint their skin, paint their fingernails. They had no idea that it was radioactive and that that was dangerous. So it was actually dentists who realized that all of these mouth cancer, jaw cancer patients that they were getting all worked at this factory. Um, and it was Curie who changed the name of these uranic rays to radioactivity. And actually, if you go to her office in France, um, the doorknob from her lab to her office and the back of her chair are still radioactive because she would be working with these radioactive materials, not wash her hands well enough, and then walk over to her door, open it, pull her chair back. And they still have those there uh, in her office. So uh, Baccarat, Curie, and 
Marie Curie's husband, Pierre Curie, uh, were awarded the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of this radioactivity. And then in 1911, Curie received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of polonium and radium. Curie's work focused on discovering different radioactive elements, so trying to go out and find these other things. Um, and then Ernest Rutherford and others focused on characterizing the radioactivity itself. So the nuclei of radioactive elements are unstable and spontaneously decompose. And this is the thing that bothers me, is it's completely spontaneous. Other chemical reactions, like we talked about with equilibrium, you can heat them up, you can use a catalyst, you can cool them down, you can do all these different things, change the pressure. Uh, none of that does anything to radioactivity and radioactive decay. Um, there are different types of radioactive emissions. There's alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays, uh, as well as positrons, which are the positive opposite of a electron. So we talked about uh, nuclear symbols. Uh, if you have the chemical symbol X, then the number sort of lower into the left, lower into the left is the atomic number, and then up into the right is the mass number. So remember, the mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and the atomic number is just the number of protons. So number of protons determines the identity of an element. The number of neutrons can vary. So those average numbers uh, make up the molar mass numbers that we use on the periodic table. <clears throat> no, yeah, so most elements have several different isotopes. So again, an isotope is where you have a different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. Isotopes can also be represented by the element name or symbol followed by a mass number because every element's gonna have the same number of protons, so all you need to do to differentiate the isotopes is identify what the, or indicate what the different mass number is. We also have symbols for um, subatomic particles. So a proton is a mass of one, and a number of protons is one. The neutron has a mass of one, but has no protons, so the atomic number is zero. Electrons uh, have a mass number of zero because they weigh so much less than a proton or a neutron, and then they have a proton number of negative one to show that they have a negative charge, so the opposite of a proton. So the first type of radioactive decay is alpha decay. This is when a unstable, an unstable nucleus emits a particle composed of two protons and two neutrons, also known as helium. So you've got an unstable nucleus emitting a helium um, atom. Uh, yeah, identical to a helium nucleus. Doesn't have any electrons though, I believe. So we, can, we have nuclear equations, so we can represent nuclear processes such as radioactivity. So if we have something, this is uranium-238, so mass number of 238 has 92 protons. If it undergoes um, alpha decay, it loses a helium nucleus. So it's a mass number of four and two protons. So two protons, two neutrons. And you just subtract those from uranium to get whatever the new daughter nucleotide is, or nucleide is. So you have these changes in identities for these radioactive elements. So we can deduce the mass number and atomic number of the unknown daughter nucleide because the equation has to be balanced. Now, like everything else in chemistry, there has to be balance. So thorium can also undergo a alpha decay. So if it loses two protons and two neutrons, what element would that be? So if we're going from 90, we lose two protons, so we go down to 88, it would be radium. And it would be radium with a mass number of 228. So four less than the parent nucleide. So alpha radiation is the 18-wheeler truck of radioactivity. 
it's large, it has a ton of energy, but if it runs into something or runs into something too big, it won't get very far. It'll do a lot of damage to the surface, but it doesn't get much farther than that. So alpha decay is not very dangerous to us because um, while it has high ionizing power, it has the lowest penetrating power. So it only hits your skin and it'll do damage to your skin, but your skin is built to sustain a lot of damage. Um, the ionizing power is the ability of radiation to ionize other molecules or atoms. So if it hits something, it can knock off electrons. Um, well, mostly it knocks off electrons, um, creating ions, which are highly reactive and can cause things like cancer. So cells dying or reproducing abnormally, cancer is an abnormal reproduction cycle for cells. Penetrating power is the ability of radiation to penetrate matter. So how far into matter will it get before stopping? Uh, alpha particles have low penetrating power because they're so big, uh, kind of like a semi-truck in a traffic jam or really a semi-truck in a traffic accident, it can't get very far because it'll hit all of the cars. Um, radi or alpha decay can be stopped by a sheet of paper, clothing, or even air. So it's that big, its penetrating power is that low that most things will stop it. Um, just don't ingest it, because once it's ingested, now you're no longer protected by your skin or the air, and it's able to emit these semi-truck particles at your internal organs. So alpha decay, high ionizing power, low penetrating power. Beta decay is when an unstable nucleus emits an electron. So the beta particle uh, is an electron. So mass number is zero, uh, proton number, atomic number is negative one, indicating that it's a negative one charge. And so this decay actually results from a neutron turning into a proton. And that negative charge that gets emitted is the beta particle. So you can increase the atomic number of something if it undergoes beta decay. So radium undergoing beta decay would become um, actinium. I think that's actinium. Um, and it will emit that beta particle. So you can see we've got one more proton, but our mass number hasn't changed. And uh, we're skipping these because they're not on the final. Beta radiation is the four-door sedan of radioactivity. So it's uh, less massive and, than the alpha particle, but it has lower ionizing power, but higher penetrating power than alpha particles. So it won't be stopped by air or clothes or a piece of paper, but it can be stopped by just a sheet of metal or a thick piece of wood. Uh, I don't think this is true, actually. I keep forgetting to change the slide. It's dangerous inside and outside the body. The one that you might be familiar with is the gamma radiation. This is the one, like, if you remember, well, if you're familiar with Chernobyl, the HBO series on Chernobyl is awesome. Um, the big problem there is that it was emitting or released a ton of material that was emitting gamma radiation. So gamma rays, unlike our alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, or even the beta particle, which is an electron, gamma rays are just high energy photons. So this is on the electromagnetic spectrum, one of the highest energy forms of light. It has no charge, no mass, um, so the atomic number and the mass number don't change for elements that undergo gamma uh, decay. But they're emitted in conjunction with other types of radiation. So the symbol here is gamma, zero charge, or zero mass number, zero protons. So if uranium, 92 undergoes a uh, alpha decay here. We lose a helium nucleus and emit this gamma radiation. Gamma rays are the motorbike of radioactivity, except it's more like a motorbike with an explosive charge attached to it. Um, it has the lowest ionizing power, 
but the highest penetrating power. The only thing that stops gamma rays is several inches of lead shielding or thick slabs of concrete. You have to put a lot of stuff in the way of gamma radiation to stop it. So hence the problem, if you have you know, a nuclear reactor that explodes, then that's going to spread material all over the place that's emitting gamma radiation. And the only way you can stop it is with several inches of lead or thick concrete, um, which you're not gonna do to you know, the hundreds of square miles that were covered in this stuff. Instead, I think what they actually did is they dug up the top foot or two of soil and all like brought it to one place. And then they also built what's called the sarcophagus, which is a giant steel and concrete structure over the top of Chernobyl. Um, anyway, so positron is the antiparticle of an electron. It has the same mass, which is essentially zero, but the opposite charge. If, I love this, if a positron, positron collides with an electron, they annihilate each other and release gamma rays because one has a negative charge, one has a positive charge, um, and so they get turned into pure energy. In a positron emission, a proton is converted into a neutron and emits a positron. So there we can get increase, we can decrease the atomic number by one and increase, or while well, having the mass number maintain the same. So when an atom emits a positron, its an atomic number decreases by one. So we go from phosphorus to silicon and release one of those positrons. So there's a table in your book um, that has all of these different types of radiation. One of the ways that we detect radioactivity, um, especially for people who are working at a nuclear uh, power plant, uh, there are still several in the US that are operating. There's one, if you've ever driven down to San Diego, the two giant like half spheres on the coast, that was a nuclear power plant, but they shut it down. I'm a big fan of nuclear power, but it does have its dangers. Let me get into those later. So a film badge dosimeter is the kind of thing that you'd wear if you worked at a nuclear power plant. In theory, all the radiation out of nuclear power plants is contained, but just in case there is some kind of leak, you would not be able to tell unless you were wearing something that could detect it. Because you can't feel gamma radiation. It passes straight through you for the most part. Some of it will strike molecules and knock out atoms, uh, ionize things, um, and can cause problems in the long run. If you can feel gamma radiation, you're already dead. Um, which happened at Chernobyl. So the badges are collected and then they're processed in a way so you can measure exposure, exposure to radiation. So it's kind of like um, that very, very early radioactivity experiment for x-rays where it's, as it's exposed to uh, radiation, it'll change color or uh, can be read with something kind of like a film. There's also a Geiger, Geiger counter, which you're probably familiar with too. They show up in movies a bunch. It's the thing that makes like all the popping sounds and it makes more and more popping sounds as you get closer to the radiation. Um, those popping sounds are actually caused by ionizing particles. Let me zoom in on this. So you have a tube here that's full of argon. Argon normally is inert, but if you have ionizing radiation, it will pass through the argon, ionize the argon, and then it will conduct electricity from this surrounding barrel to uh, an anode in the argon. And every time that happens, it creates that popping sound. It gets registered uh, by an amplifier or counter. So you can actually detect radioactivity with one of these instruments. There's also a scintillation counter, um, which passes through a special material that emits ultraviolet or visible light in response to excitation by energetic particles. Similar type to the Geiger counter. Uh, radioactivity is actually a natural part of the environment. Um, humans and other living organisms have adapted to survive in it. That's why our DNA, or one of the reasons I should say, 
their DNA and our bodies have methods for coping with broken or misformed DNA strands. Most of the time, those get detected and then destroyed. Cancer happens when it doesn't get detected and that causes the cell to not terminate, um, but to reproduce forever. If you're, actually, if you're interested in like cancer research, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks was a woman, don't know when, but they, she had a cancer tumor that scientists were able to sample and then culture infinitely. And so her cells, I'm sure, are still being used today for cancer research because it's this sort of infinite culture of cancer cells. Um, there's a lot of controversy, though, because it was largely done without her consent. But, you know. <clears throat> huh? No biggie. No biggie. It's just, you know. I, it, was, it was a, yeah, a while ago. So we can, we can survive. We've evolved to handle small amounts of radiation. Uh, the ground contains radioactive elements, radioactive atoms. Actually, in places, especially in places where there are basements, uh, I know Michigan is actually one of them because I stayed in a house there that had one of these. There can be a lot of radium that comes out of the ground as a gas. And that radio, radium is radioactive. I think it's radium, or maybe it's radon. I think it's radon is a gas. So that radon gas can collect in basements and can be dosing you with radioactivity. You would never know it. Again, because if you can feel it, you're already dead. Um, so they have special pumps that will circulate, catch and circulate all of the radio, radon out of the room. But there is a cave in, I think it's in England, the UK somewhere, where they actually do radon treatments because a small amount of radiation, or the right amount, there's a therapeutic dose where it can help with chronic pain. Scientists do not know why, but there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who it has helped. And it's sort of undeniable that it's helped this number of people, but there's still no explanation for why. So you can go there and you can pay to sit in this cave and get a small dose of controlled radiation. Um, on the periodic table, if we look at any element beyond uh, bismuth, which is 83, are all unstable and radioactive. And actually, the amounts of those elements in the Earth are dependent on their half-life. So elements that have a very short half-life, um, we have very, very little of. Elements that have a really long half-life, something like uranium, there's a decent amount in, still in the Earth's crust. And then other stuff um, is created from radioactive decay. Actually, let's walk to this. I have a meme for this. Uh, well, maybe we should wait till it gets a decay series. Okay, we'll come back to that. Oh, good, half-life. I guess I didn't explain half-life yet. So because radioactivity happens spontaneously, we don't know how much, or we don't know when any particular atom is going to decay. It happens statistically. Um, and it turns out you can model that with something called a half-life. Uh, you might be familiar with half-lives for different drugs. Um, something like caffeine, I think, has a half-life of about six hours in the body. And so what that means is, for caffeine at least, in six hours, your body will have processed half of the caffeine. And then after another six hours, it'll have processed another half. What is going on with the projector today? So same thing happens with radioactive, um, unstable radioactive particles they will decay in their half-lives, and they will decay at that rate until they're all gone. Um, you can't just take half of the initial amount, so it's not two half-lives to get rid of all of it, but after one half-life, you have one half. After another half-life, you'll have one quarter. After another half-life, you'll have one eighth, then one sixteenth, 32, 64, 128, um, until it is eventually just one, and then that one decays. Uh, so the, the shorter the half-life is, the more radioactive something is, and the more dangerous it is. So radon has a half-life of approximately one minute. 
So rate on 220, in one minute we'll go down to, uh, if we have a million to start with, then it'll be half a million, quarter million. And because it's decaying that rapidly, it's emitting a lot of radiation, because every single one of those radon atoms that decays emits radiation. Thorium-232, on the other hand, is much less dangerous because its half-life is 14 billion years. So relatively speaking, very stable. So that means that it's decaying very slowly, which means that it's actually emitting very little radiation. You can actually get, uh, what was it? It was like a Fiesta, Fiesta wear? They're like these plates that have uranium paint in them, or uranium, not paint, but uh, whatever they use on ceramics. Um, so there's uranium in them, and they are slightly radioactive, more than other stuff. Um, but they're not that dangerous because it's a fairly stable isotope of uranium. Still more, more dangerous than a non-radioactive plate. Is it just rose-colored plates? Huh? Is it the plates that are all colored? The they're really colored, yeah. I think it's Fiesta wear. <laughs> yeah. I have you have those? <laughs> they're radioactive. But again, it's... <laughs> fairly stable, so it's not that dangerous. My mother-in-law actually showed me, she has a ring that's made of uranium glass, and again, stable isotope of uranium, or relatively stable, so not super dangerous. You should try shining a black light on them. Yeah. I think with the uranium glass, it, they glow under black light. Uh, so this is just the concept of half-lives again that every time you cut whatever concentration you have, it half. And you get different types of uh, radioactivity for these decays. What I want to get to, though, um, yeah, radioactive decay series. So naturally radioactive elements have either very long half-lives or are being continually formed by some other process. And for a lot of these things, it's from uranium. Um, so when uranium decays into thorium with a half-life of 4.47 billion years, uh, and then thorium will decay to protactinium, and then protactinium will decay into uh, uranium-234, different isotope. And so it keeps going through all these steps. So that was the meme that I have. So uranium decays helium into thorium, then thorium into, I think it was protactinium, then helium and actinide, then francium, and then astatine, and then bismuth, polonium, and it just keeps on going. I think that's the last one, no. Uh, ultimately, this pathway ends in a stable, non-radioactive form of lead. So this is the radioactive decay series. So this is exactly what was happening in that GIF. We were going from uranium to thorium, uh, palladium maybe, but through this series. So first going from uranium to thorium is in alpha decay. And so that alpha decay takes us from 238 to 234 mass, and then beta decay, another beta decay, so our mass number stays the same, and then it's alpha decays all the way down to lead 214, uh, and then we go through the rest of this decay series until we end up at lead 206. So one of the really cool applications of this is radio, radiocarbon dating. So uh, ancient artifacts contain radioactive signature that reveals their age. The signature results from the presence of radioactive carbon-14 in the environment. So carbon-14, go to the next slide, yeah, is constantly formed in the upper atmosphere. Um, because of neutron bombardment from space onto nitrogen, and that nitrogen then decays into carbon-14 and hydrogen. Carbon-14 decay uh, decays back into nitrogen and a beta emission with a half-life of 5,730 years. So what you can do is, since this amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is almost perfectly constant, um, it is being 
constantly taken up by living organisms, especially plants and animals. So anything that's made out of um, plant material, animal materials, um, even things like wood, are going to have, when they die, a specific ratio of carbon-14 that exists in the atmosphere. And then after they died, they stop replacing those carbon atoms. So as those carbon atoms decay, they decay at the steady rate of half-life. So it doesn't matter if they're under hot conditions, cold conditions, anything else. It's a stable decay rate. And so you can use the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 to determine how old something is. Was it 50,000 years? Yeah. So the maximum age that you can do this with is about 50,000 years, because after that point, there's not enough carbon-14 in the material to be detectable. So they first tried this out um, on objects where they knew the age, or if they had, if they had been dated, or um, came from other things that we knew the date of. Checking against things like tree rings or um, different layers of sediment. So if you look at the concentration of C14 in an object and see that it's got only 6.250% relative to living organisms, then it's about 22,920 years old. Uh, we could do this one really quick because it's pretty easy. So if there's an ancient scroll claimed to have originated from Greek scholars in about 500 BC, uh, we can do some carbon dating on it and say, okay, carbon dating content reveals that it has 100% of that found in living organisms. Can the scroll be authentic? No. No. Because if it was an authentic scroll, then it should have, uh, let's see, what did they say, 500 BC, so 2,500 years at least. So it should be somewhere between 150, 150%, right? So it should be less than 100%. Um, in the mid, oh yes, 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 fission. So in the mid 1930s, Enrico Fermi attempted to synthesize a new element by bombarding uranium with neutrons. His theory was that if a neutron were incorporated into the nucleus, it might undergo beta decay, convert that neutron into a proton, and then suddenly you have a new element. Uh, he detected beta emission, but never chemically examined the products to determine if a new element had been formed. Later, when the experiment was repeated, they found that the products contained several elements lighter than uranium. So rather than make a new heavier or a new uh, product with a higher number of protons, they discovered nuclear fission. So splitting a uranium atom. So the uranium atom split into barium and krypton and three neutrons and released enormous amounts of energy. That energy, by the way, I think this is interesting. So you know Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. That's a relationship between mass and energy. So if you can take matter and convert it into energy, it does so at this rate. That mass is then multiplied by the speed of light squared. So speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So three times 10 to the eight squared is three times 10 to the 16 times the amount of mass that you, and I think this is in joules, times the amount of mass that you convert into energy. So when you do this nuclear fission, some of the mass of the uranium gets turned into energy. And if you do this with one atom, not that big a deal. But these three protons that get released, they can go out and collide with other uranium atoms, cause them to undergo fission, and then release three more protons. So you can have a cascade effect where one uranium uh, is, or undergoes fusion, releases three protons, three more uranium atoms undergo fission, release three more protons, um, and you have a chain reaction. 
And this is the um, technology, the idea that created the atomic bomb. So fearing that Nazi Germany would develop an atomic bomb first, um, because a lot of the scientists who came over and worked on the Manhattan Project, I believe, were German. Um, the first nuclear weapon was detonated in 1945 in New Mexico. It had a force equivalent to 18,000 tons of dynamite. Um, Germany had already surrendered, but two, two bombs were dropped on Japan in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, interesting fact about this atomic bomb in New Mexico, it was placed on a metal, sort of like oil derrick looking thing that was completely vaporized. Like it went from being solid steel to gas gaseous steel in a fraction of a second. Um, yeah, if the best place to be when a nuclear bomb goes off, aside from completely outside the blast radius, is right underneath it. Because if you're right underneath it, then you will also be vaporized instantly. Um, because nuclear bombs are horrific. There are walls in Japan that are still standing. They left them up because they have silhouettes on them of people who were standing between the wall and the nuclear bomb when it went off. And so the radiation was blocked enough by them to create these shadows. Yeah. Atomic bombs are scary. But it releases a lot of energy. So if you do it in a very controlled manner, then you can use fission to generate electricity. Um, I wonder if this is still accurate, though. It says 20% of the US's electricity is generated by fission. Uh, I know when I did some of my research in Michigan, we drove, there's a uh, nuclear power plant just outside of uh, Michigan City, and uh, drove past that a lot. It had your, the typical giant uh, condenser tower. So right, a lot of our electricity does come from nuclear. A pencil-sized cylinder of uranium could power a typical car for 20 years of driving around, while a coal-burning power plant uses 2 million kilograms of fuel to generate the same power as 50 kilo kilograms of fueled, uh, nuclear fuel in a nuclear power plant. The problem, of course, is that once that nuclear fuel has been used, it's now highly radioactive. Um, so the problem has been that where do we store all of this waste? Because again, we have no way to dispose of it uh, and make it not radioactive anymore. Uh, this is also, I think this is funny, because almost all of our electricity, even that from a nuclear power plant, uh, comes from making steam. So coal is burned to boil water to make steam to generate electricity. Nuclear power heats up water to generate steam to create electricity. You know, everything is a turbine, uh, and steam is still the best way to turn turbines. So I believe this is a similar setup to what was in Chernobyl. Um, so what happened to Chernobyl is not that the there was a nuclear explosion. It was actually this uh, the steam vessel and the containment shell that blew up because it's held under super high pressure and at super high temperatures, but the explosion of that steam carried with it the nuclear material. Um, yeah. The nuclear core contains uranium, and then if you remember, Every time uranium undergoes fission, it releases three protons. So one of the ways you control the reaction is you try to absorb two of those protons so that you're only getting the same amount of uranium you're reacting all the time rather than it spiraling out of control. So there are neutron absorbing control rods for that. This is, someday we'll get nuclear fusion. So nuclear fission is where you split a nucleus, nuclear fusion is where you take two nuclei and you stick them together. Um, nuclear fusion is the power of the sun. And it's usually the combination of, I think, deuterium or tritium, which are heavy 
hydrogen atoms, combining those together to make helium. Both fission and fusion are highly exothermic, but fusion uh, generates more heat and more energy than fission does. And its only waste product is helium, which we're currently running out of helium. So that would be a good thing. The hydrogen bomb has a thousand times the explosive force of, the, of an atomic bomb using fission. Yeah, deuterium and tritium combine to form helium-4 and a neutron. And it's actually a small fission bomb that is detonated to start the fusion reaction. So the problem with fusion is, like the sun, it actually takes an intense amount of heat to cause fusion to happen. So the fusion reactors are, actually I think there's a picture in here. Yeah, this is a tokamak reactor. And it creates an electromagnetic donut and puts a, it's actually hotter than the sun. A plasma that's hotter than the sun is the jelly filling to that electromagnetic donut. The problem is, is it takes way more electricity to contain the plasma than you can draw back out of it. So we can do fusion, and we could do, actually can't even do maintained fusion in one of these. So nothing can, nothing can withstand the temperatures. What time is it? Six o'clock. So acute radiation damage results from the exposure to large amounts of radiation in a short time. Main sources being nuclear bombs or an exposed nuclear reactor core, and primarily gamma radiation. You get large numbers of cells dying, uh, particularly in the, in the immune system and intestinal lining, which obviously causes problems. What the heck? Uh, and weakened immune system, you have an in it, or a decreased ability to absorb nutrients, so you get infections, and you can't really eat that well, um, so it's kind of a double whammy. In mild cases, you can survive, but uh, usually death due to infection results from more extreme cases. Um, in those extreme cases too, there's this phenomenon where when you get hit by that blast of radiation, it causes a lot of immediate damage. Your body starts working to clear that damage, and then after about two weeks, you start to feel better before things get worse because your body has cleared away all of the damage, but now is, has a weakened immune system, can't absorb nutrients, and so is unable to replace the stuff that was damaged. So lower doses of radiation over long periods of time increase cancer risk. And we're talking here about high ionizing power radiation, not the radiation from your iPad or phone, which is all lower, closer to radio wave radiation. Uh, but it can cause damage to DNA, which if your body doesn't destroy that DNA, then can cause cancer. You can also get genetic defects, so radiation exposure can cause con genetic defects. Um, DNA in eggs or sperm are damaged. The offspring might have those uh, genetic abnormalities. Uh, it's actually, I think the radiation is actually used to sterilize insects. So you can do like sterile insect or mosquito releases. So you take a bunch of males, and they're usually actually genetically modified to be better at mating, but they're all sterile. So you release out thousands of these, they go out and mate with female mosquitoes, but then those female mosquitoes don't have any eggs. So they outcompete the fertile males to reduce mosquito populations. So radiation exposure can be measured as the number of decay events to which a person is exposed. So how many events of radioactive isotopes decaying did you get exposed to? So one of those is the Curie. So one Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 decay events per second. And then a rhodogen is a measure of charge that you are exposed to. Um, and then human radiation is often reported in REMS, or rhodogen equivalent man, which is a weighted measure of radiation exposure that accounts for the ionizing power of different types of radiation. So was it gamma radiation, beta radiation, alpha radiation? Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're all exposed to some radiation all the time. Um, 
on average, you get about a third of a rem of radiation per year. And most of it comes from natural sources. Again, I mentioned radon gas coming out of the ground, um, which is one of the decay products of uranium. Also, bananas are like surprisingly radioactive. So you get more radiation from a banana than other food. Um, it takes more radiation than the natural amount to produce measurable health effects in humans, right? We're adapted to the levels of radiation that we're exposed to all the time. But you can have, again, decreased white blood cell count, so damage to your immune system, um, with just a dose of 20 rem. So it'd be like 60 years of radiation in an instant. All right, last couple of things. Uh, isotope scanning is a radio radioactive isotopes introduced to the body, and then you're able to detect where that radiation is coming from because it targets certain parts of the body. Technetium-99 is used for body scans like this one. Uh, radioactive iodine is used for thyroid cancer because your thyroid soaks up all the iodine in your body. So if you give it radioactive iodine, it will go in there and kill any tumors. Uh, you can use radiation for, or radiation therapy for cancers, right? So rapidly dividing cells are more damaged by radiation. This is why, um, well, actually, it's the same thing that chemo does, but chemo does it to your whole body. So the reason you lose your hair when you get chemo is because the hair follicles are rapidly dividing cells. They are most affected by the chemo, so all your hair falls out because you're unable to replace it. Um, so if you got radiation therapy to your head, you would probably have a bald spot. Um, one of the ways they do this, though, is if you use a sort of weak beam of gamma rays and you rotate it around the person, so if we're like looking at a cross-section of somebody's torso, expertly drawn, let's say there's a cancer tumor here. So what they do is they take the radiation and they'll shine it from here, and then they'll rotate that around. So all of the surrounding tissue is getting a low dose of radiation, but the cancer is getting a very high dose of radiation. All right, that's chapter 17. Look, we're done early. <laughs> is that legal in the US? Which one? Uh, radiation therapy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It depends on the like, type of cancer that you have. Like Some cancers will be more susceptible, some will be less. Some will be somewhere where you really don't want to direct any radiation. But, yeah. Uh, if you want to stick around, I'm going to move over to the lab. If you have questions about the practice final, or we could do it in here, I suppose. So if you have questions about the practice final, questions about the final, if you want to ask about other chemistry stuff, I will re-explain anything.